Welcome to Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire, where authors talk about things that never happened to people who don't exist. We also cover craft, the agent hunt, query trenches, publishing industry, marketing, and more. I'm your host, Mindy McGinnis. You can check out my books and social media at mindymcginnis.com. And make sure to visit the Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire blog for additional interviews, query critiques, and more at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. Today's guest is Sarah Jane Stratford. Her first novel, Radio Girls, was based on the early days of the BBC and its pioneering talks producer, Hilda Matheson. Red Letter Days, her newest novel, continues that tradition by similarly highlighting a little-known but influential woman in media. Set during the 1950s Red Scare and inspired by the real-life TV producer Hannah Weinstein, Red Letter Days reveals the untold story of women who escaped the Hollywood blacklist. Sarah joined me today to talk about the inspiration for Red Letter Days and the research involved in writing about the Red Scare. So your new book is called Red Letter Days, and it is all about the 1950s Red Scare. And it talks a bit about how it affected women, particularly on the Hollywood blacklist, which we've known and heard many stories about men in Hollywood who fell victim to the Red Scare. But as with all topics, we we hear much, much less about the women. And so your new book is inspired in many ways by uh, Hannah Weinstein. So if you would talk a little bit about who Hannah was and then also about how you came across the concept for the book and how Hannah's story drew you in, that would be great. Love your introduction because that is exactly how I approach almost all my work. And even back when I was a student of history, it was always my question is whose stories are not being told. And inevitably, it was always the stories of women, the stories of more marginalized people. And that was what I was naturally more drawn to. Um, so yeah, in the case of, of Hannah Weinstein, she's this extraordinary woman who it just deserves so much more recognition. Um, she had initially been a fairly firebrand liberal journalist. She was a speechwriter. She worked for Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia in New York, very staunch liberal. And she sort of saw which way the winds were blowing post-war as the House on american Activities Committee you know, really was finding its feet. And she decamped from the U.S. fairly early and completely reinvented herself as a producer. Came to a point where she was able to set up her own production company. And the first major program that the company produced was The Adventures of Robin Hood, which began in 1955. It's a wonderful program. It actually still really holds up. But at the time, you know, there were a lot of people who talked about how well shot it was and you know, how wonderful the scripts were. Well, behind the scenes, the reasons the scripts were so wonderful is because every single one of them was written by a blacklisted writer, and in including um, it's the chief writer uh, was Ring Lardner Jr., who had won an Oscar for his script for Woman of the Year. He's Famous, if people know much about some of the Hollywood Ten's testimony before Congress, so he was one of the Hollywood Ten, and when he was asked the famous question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, he answered, well, I could answer the question as, as you'd like me to, but I'd hate myself in the morning, which is a wonderful quote, um, cited him for contempt of Congress, and he went to prison, as many of the Hollywood Ten did. He was very grateful to Hannah and helped get a lot of other writers in touch with her. Um, and yes, so for the several years that Robin Hood ran, it was always scripted by blacklisted writers. You know, she was determined to try and keep people's careers going at great risk to herself. If the operation had been uncovered, she certainly would have faced extradition and prison. So she was doing this work then uh, from London, is that correct? 
Yes, yes, that's correct. The company she ran was called Sapphire Films. It was based here in London. Mm. And I know that your first book called Radio Girls was about the early Mm. days of the BBC and a woman named Hilda Matheson who worked there. Yes. So did you come across information that led you to Hannah's story while you were working on Radio Girls? No, not at all. Although it is kind of funny. First book's radio, second book is television. Right, right. It's rather unintentional, but I kind of like the way it shook out. Um, No, look, I do love me some badass women. Um, (laughs) So so that's that connection. But no, um, really what led me to Red Letter Days was... Immediately following the 2016 election, I was despondent, and and I got to thinking about America and American history and American mythology about itself. There's just certain things, certain stories that, as Americans, you know, we all believe about ourselves and you know who we are and who we've always been. And of course, you know, you don't need to poke at it too hard to find all the holes. It got me thinking about the blacklist, which was something I, I knew about you know, as a, a historian, as a cultural historian. And, and it did strike me as, as having some interesting potential parallels, which actually at the time thought could happen. And of course, increasingly, they have been happening. I mean, it's only in the past couple of weeks that you know, there've been talk of uh, purges from the government, which was certainly something that happened during the Red Scare. You know, people on lists. It is interesting how how little does change. But uh, but initially, I was thinking about how you know the Red Scare came about in large part you know, out of fear, and then that fear was used to suppress voices of liberalism, voices of dissent, mm-hmm. and how once that began, it was very easy to spiral. And of course, you know, so many of us, when we we think about it, we do think about what happened in Hollywood. But in fact, uh, the Red Scare, you know, cast a very wide net. Teachers, journalists, union members, activists, the NAACP was very widely targeted. It was very far reaching. And of course, what was most effective really was the climate of fear. And that was very long lasting. It was interesting. I went back and I was looking at contemporary uh, footage and things. And when they were attempting to desegregate schools in the South, uh, a lot of the anti-desegregation forces were, were carrying signs saying, you know, no communists. That was just always that correlation, you know, and that, that remained the idea, you know, through the 50s and well into the 60s, and really still today. Fear is how you control people. There's no doubt. There's a lot of power in that. There's lots of power in fear. Absolutely. I wanted to follow up with you about when you're writing fiction that is based on a real person. In the case of Red Letter Days, Hannah Weinstein. Your main Mm. character, though, is only based on her. It is not actually Hannah. Your main character's last name is Wolfson in the book. So how do you as a writer then blur those lines between fiction and history and reality? You know, it's a little different each time. And to a certain extent, as I develop the character and think about the character, I let the character kind of go, you know, forge their path. In the case of Hannah, as I was working on it, I realized for the sake of my story, I was just going to make a lot of changes and suppositions. It just felt much more natural to have her be an inspiration, you know, rather than try and write something that skewed a little more biographical. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a fiction writer, I'm not a biographer. I do think a very good biography of her needs to exist. At any time, I'm much more about the drama. It worked better to have her be um uh, slightly more fictionalized. Now, there, there were various and sundry little details about her life that it just wasn't going to work for my narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly as I created this wholly fictional character, 
uh, with whom she interacts and who's the other main character of the book. It just worked out better. But yeah, each time is a little bit different. I, 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 I try not to have any sort of a set formula. I don't like to put myself in a box. Coming up, the challenge of basing a fictional character on a real person and the lasting repercussions of the Red Scare. This episode of Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire is sponsored by Personal Revolution Podcast. Have you been stuck inside wondering how to take charge of your life? Is there something you want to do but haven't been able to yet? In Personal Revolution, bestselling author and life coach Allison Task helps you take control of your life with inspiration and humor so that you move from where you are now to where you want to be and have fun doing it. It's like having a personal coach whispering in your ear. This three-month podcast course, along with bonus episodes each month, will help you create a clear vision for what you want out of life, remove the frustrating blocks that are holding you back, develop a detailed action plan that will drive you to where you want to be, and build the network that will help you create your future. The Personal Revolution podcast comes with a personal workbook and real-time access to a community of other changemakers working toward their goals with positivity, possibility, and momentum. And for a limited time, all of this is available to you for free. Download the Himalaya app in your app store, look up Personal Revolution, and enter promo code REVOLUTION at checkout to get your first month absolutely free. If you're ready to go after a better life, you are ready for personal revolution. Here's a sneak peek. Hi, my name is Allison Task, and I am the host of Personal Revolution. Are you ready to be happy and do that thing you always wanted to do? Well, I am thrilled to announce that I have now made available for free the Personal Revolution podcast course. This course is based on my best-selling book, and it is now yours for free wherever you like to listen to podcasts. It includes 10 original episodes with plenty of never-released-before content, and then it includes a premium version for $4.99 a month. You will get a customized workbook. You'll get access to a private community on Himalaya, and you'll have just-in-time audio drop-ins from me again in the community on Himalaya. Just go to Himalaya.com, look up Personal Revolution, and type in Revolution to get your first month for free. I'll look forward to seeing you in the community. Anytime you're writing a historical model, obviously you have to do research of some type. Everything has an element that perhaps you don't even consider. So for example, I have written a novel, it's not published yet, but I've written a novel that takes place in uh, 1918. And I have a woman falling down some steps and uh, she loses consciousness. And at one point, you know, people are running over to her and I have her shoe like falling down a couple of steps below her. And then I got to thinking about it. I'm like, well, but wait a minute what do her shoes look like? Could they even come off? And, you know, I did some research. It's like, no, her shoes probably were buckled up um, and more than likely could not have come off of her feet when she fell down the stairs. So that was something that just this tiny scene and this little visual of this shoe sitting there without a foot in it, could that actually happen? Were there any scenes like that, any small moments where you were like, wait, I have to go do some research on some surprising thing that I just did not expect to pop up. It, it's funny because yes, so many, and then I have to stop and think, oh yeah, but what were they exactly? For me, research is sort of the most fun and and yet also in, in many ways the most frustrating because you get an idea and you love it and then you realize, ah, that actually wouldn't happen. Curse it. <laughs> Curses. It tends to be less so for me these days than not, um, only because I do so much research before that by the time I sit down to writing, I sort of more or less feel fairly comfortable with the trappings of the daily lives. Those should move along pretty well. I mean, there, there were definitely little things. At some point in, in an earlier draft, I had Hannah when she was still in the States. She was in a particular press club. And then it was only later that I realized, oh, wait, it hadn't yet opened its doors to women by this particular time. So it would be little things like that. 
And and of course, inevitably, by the way, you always end up, you know, some mistake always sneaks through and then some reader, you know, will, will, will email you and say, love the book. You know, you made this little mistake. Like, ah, rats. Yep. <laughs> Never fails. That's why I don't, I enjoy writing historical fiction, uh, but if I can get away with it, I never set my uh, story anywhere that is real. Like, obviously you have nah. to with this particular story, but I always set it somewhere else because inevitably right. you have people being like, well, you have this street running north-south that actually runs east-west. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, I don't, I don't care. It doesn't matter. That doesn't affect the story, right? But they, they want to tell you that you are wrong. And so I very much, I will <laughs> adhere to facts right up until it becomes arbitrary. Oh, Completely. And Peter Morgan, who wrote uh, Frost Nixon and The Queen and you know, mm -hmm. other such stories, you know, I, I once went to a talk he was giving and he said he, in fact, writes the story first and then goes back and does the research. Really? But, yeah, which I, I thought was amazing. And I queried it, actually. But he said, you know, really, the drama must take precedence over the history. And I like, guess, no, and I, and I respect that. Absolutely. So same vein, did you have any assumptions that you, mm. any preconceived notions that you were hoping to use or some element of the story or just, as I said, any, any thoughts ahead of time that when you dove into your research, you found contradictory? Did you have any assumptions that were erroneous about the time period, I guess? Or the story itself, um, not so much erroneous. Uh, it's 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 more that certain things were surprising about some of the details of mm -hmm. what was going on, um, how people were persecuted by the FBI. I guess vis-a-vis -vis things like phone mm -hmm. tapping, I you know got a lot of my assumptions about that based on film and television, <laughs> and. Okay. And and so I thought, oh, okay, well, it must be a certain sort of way. And what I was not expecting was that it was actually absolutely bonkers. You could have a situation whereby, so if you had more than one phone, all the same line, one would ring, but then the other would ring a few seconds later. And it would really clue you in that actually something was amiss. And then it would get odder than that. You might answer the phone and nobody would be there, which more or less tracked with what I assumed might be the case. But what did often happen was that you would answer the phone and what you would hear was a recording of one of your very own conversations <gasps> that oh might God. have happened like a few days or a few weeks or even further back than that. And of course, what, what I thought was, well, now, wait a minute. Someone would obviously pick up that their phone was being seriously interfered with. And that's when it hit me. Well, yes, of course. And that's the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, because it comes back to what we said before. It's about the fear. Yeah. So they wanted people to know. Exactly. That's how wow. you silence people. That's how you get people from continuing to live comfortable lives. Mm -hmm. You know, that I mean, if, if someone is always looking behind them, but themselves, then they can't be looking forward, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. people are less likely to continue to be activists or you know, engaged with any level of society if if they're you know, that nervous about what may be going on. It, it was an eye opener. <laughs> that's that's fascinating. So fleeing to London, then she still suffered persecution, wiretappings, yeah. intimidation, things like this. So yeah. I have to say, I personally don't know much about McCarthy era outside of the U.S. So, like, how would that work? Were British forces uh, doing this, or was this the FBI? So, well, this was the FBI, and. It's interesting. I mean, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was another thing that that really stunned me when I read it. But most European governments found the whole concept of the blacklist ridiculous. And even though they mm -hmm. themselves were not exactly pro-communist, neither did they 
agree with what was going on in America. And to the extent they could, they did try to protect people. Mm -hmm. But uh, things would happen. Uh, the American embassy would send out uh, erroneous uh, notifications to Americans abroad saying, oh, you have to come to the embassy and bring your passport. You know, we need to check it for something or other in the hopes that they would indeed come and then their passport would be sequestered. And even if perhaps there was not grounds to arrest them, they would effectively find themselves stateless. So, so various and sundry things like that were going on. And it was pretty shocking. But the British government, to its great credit, you know, really did try and help people as much as it possibly could. But also people really had to help each other. What's interesting to me is that, of course, the 1950s was not all that long ago. And I remember 10, 15 years ago now when Elia Kazan was given the Lifetime Recognition Award by the uh, by the Oscar, by the Academy. And I was pretty young when it happened. And I used to follow film really closely. And I remember watching that year and the camera panned the audience. And there were quite a few actors that were not applauding and were not standing up and were refusing to participate. And I didn't understand why. And, and I ended up like asking my mother and she explained a little bit about how he was one of the people that was giving up names and uh, reporting on other people in film and then was rewarded for that with some of these roles that he was being recognized for. It was so interesting to me because, as I said, I was pretty young and I had no concept of the Blacklist and McCarthy era. Like It meant nothing to me. And then here, you know, 40 years later, I was still there was still repercussions and there were people who were refusing to participate in the celebration of this person. Oh, absolutely. He he was widely unforgiven, um, in large part because it was generally believed that he didn't have to do what he did. Right. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. But indeed, the fact remains that he decided to name names and his career absolutely soared, whereas... Mm -hmm. Many others who were you know, certainly just as talented and capable as he saw their careers ruined forever. It's a complicated question. I mean, it's 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 interesting because a large part of my research, I read memoirs. A lot of people were fairly philosophical about those who name names and saying, you know, mm -hmm. it's difficult because obviously not everyone had the same opportunities and comforts as others. So so whereas you know, there were some who you know had some other resources and could manage um there were others who were really caught you know if they had young children and perhaps elderly relatives you know, all of whom were relying mm -hmm. upon them and they could uh, they could get philosophical themselves in saying the names are already known, so what difference does it make if I name them? Which, by the way, was true. So they went ahead and did it for the sake of their livelihood. And you know, and and years later, there are some who were able to say, well, it wasn't the choice I made, but I understand it. And others who said, you know, if we'd all stuck together. But who knows? It's it's complicated. I, I That's why... Uh, the playwright Lillian Hellman, you know, called her memoir of the period "Scoundrel Time." So many people were indeed scoundrels, but they were made to be by a situation that you know forced this upon them. Yes, and it's it's very difficult to put yourself in that type of situation. A lot of people, I work with high schoolers. Uh, I worked in a high school for about 14 uh. years and God bless them. I love their youth and their courage, but <laughs> most often they haven't had enough experience yet in the world to understand a complex situation like that. Most of them, not all by far. Right. But I always sure, very sure. often in, with younger people and some naive adults too, saying things like, 
<laughs> oh, well, if that would have happened to me, I would have done this or I would have done that. And it's like, no, you don't know what you would have done. You you do not know until you're there. You can take a guess. Absolutely. You can take a guess, but you cannot say with any type of conviction how you are going to perform and behave in a high stress situation until you are in it. Oh, no, completely. And, you know, these people's lives were just being intruded upon every day. I mean, they knew that they were being followed by FBI agents. You know, they knew that, you know, everything they did, you know, and any any research they did in the library, uh, the posts they were receiving, you know, even even the groceries they were shopping for, you know, they knew that all of it was being scrutinized. It is very difficult to live under after a while, yeah, it's very grating. I mean, it's no wonder relationships fell apart. You know, there were and there were schisms between children and parents, you know, whole families, I mean there were whole groups of families who you know really never spoke to each other again it, it has it was very very complicated it is complicated it's a complicated situation and it's something that uh i see you know the same dynamics are at work in different areas always i mean there are different uh, parts of the world in different um time periods where you know, you have the the power and then those with less power and the people that are speaking out and the people that are trying to squelch their voices. And it's always it's the same dynamic. We're just wearing different hats, I think. No, completely, completely. And and that was certainly something I, I had at the back of my mind whilst I was writing. And that's something I was hoping to put across History is is never really that far away. We we always do need to think about you know, what's come before and what's happening now, and you know how can we apply it, and what can we try to do to do better this time around? Because that's the one thing that you know, history does give us. It does give you know we we have the opportunity to do better. Yeah, yeah, very much, very much. Well, and that's when my students are saying things like, well, this is what I would have done, you know, if the Nazis came for me. And I'm like, well, hey, you might get your chance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Last thing. Why don't you let listeners know where they can find you online and where they can purchase the book? Right. Well, of course, I always say, please purchase from your local independent bookshop. Uh, we we love our independent bookshops. For people who happen to be listening right now, uh, we haven't discussed it, but you know we are in in the middle of dealing with the coronavirus, and of course, a lot of people aren't going out shopping. But it is a good time, particularly now, to try and support independent businesses. Many independent bookshops will do uh, online orders or um, even in person deliveries. You know, you just need to call and ask, and and that would be wonderful. Uh, Got to support our local businesses. Um, as for me, uh, I have a website, sarahjanestratford.com. I am on Instagram at, at Sarah Jane Stratford, Twitter at Stratford SJ, uh, Facebook, uh, where all else. And the book is also available from the libraries. We also, we do love our libraries. Writer, Writer, Pants on Fire is produced by Mindy McGinnis. Music by Jack Corbel. Don't forget to check out the blog for additional interviews, writing advice, and publication tips at writerwriterpantsonfire.com. If the blog or podcast have been helpful to you, or if you just enjoy listening, please consider donating. Visit writerwriterpantsonfire.com and click support the blog and podcast in the sidebar. <laughs>